Hey, what's up you guys? Today we're going to do just a really quick inking of an existing character that I have had for a while. I am currently developing a whole character series um, around uh, two characters actually. One of them is called Freddy and he's a Yeti and the other one is Eddie and he is a Bigfoot. So um, the last uh, video that I did was a review of a product and I'll put the link down in the description below that I really thought was awesome and in that video uh, I did um, an inking of an existing character and that character of course was Freddy. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do something similar but a little bit different. Um, I'm trying out some new software and some new ways of doing things on the channel and as always I always want to make sure and explain exactly what I'm doing and what's going on. So we're going to be working in Photoshop, working on my main work machine today. So behind me on the right hand side that's sort of my product review, you know, traditional uh, warm-up drawing desk uh, but today we're going to be actually working on my Mac and I'm going to be in OBS Studio and Photoshop and hopefully we can get things rolling and you'll enjoy the process. So let's go ahead and see if we can't get you started. All right, so here we are. Did a little transition for you guys. Working in Photoshop today. <clears throat> Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, this particular character, of course, is Freddy, and I've done a whole series of these particular characters. I've done, as you can see, I've done a whole <laughs> slew of them. I kind of got out of control, but that's that's always fun, right? We always like having fun. So this, of course, is the 12 Days of Yeti. I'm going to be adding to this as I progress through the holiday season, and eventually I'd like to get an entire sketchbook, um, you know, character base so I can kind of draw from. You know, this is just the holidays. I'd like to inject him into possibly Valentine's Day, you know, having, do, having him do some other fun little activities here and there. And of course, We've got his brother, which is going to be fun doing Bigfoot. I love doing uh, things like that. So let's go ahead and we've got you here in Photoshop. So in Photoshop, over here on the right-hand side, if uh, if I can show you guys, so we're going to expand that particular menu. We're going to draw the properties up. I don't usually have this window up unless I'm measuring something. My window overall for Photoshop is really streamlined down to only the essentials that I need because I want to maximize that real estate to cater to the drawing process. So over here I've got my layers over here if I'm doing any text which I do a lot of I'll have the character uh, the the text character and the history. I will utilize history um, quite a bit if I decide to go back and compare and contrast the stages of the sketch. So he might be down here and then uh, a lot of times I will actually Great. have this. Glad to hear it. My watch has been doing some really weird things. Maybe the way I talk it, it hears what I do. So here's the brush palette right here and a lot of times I'll have that down there if I want to change uh, the tip feel or something like that. And I'll have that readily available. And this is pretty much it. This is where I live <coughs> the majority of my day. And I've got my color wheel up here on the left and the tools over here on the left-hand side. I've kind of streamlined, streamlined things down uh, to the point where I don't have a lot of extra uh, things going on on my screen. You know, a lot of times I'll even go ahead and press full screen and I'll have just the drawing there and it doesn't... Um, you know those uh, extra tabs and menus won't distract me. So what brush am I using? This is the brush that a lot of people have asked about and I've told hundreds of people. I mean a lot of times I'll put it in the video where I got this specific, this specific brush but I've told hundreds of people where to get it. If you go to CreatureArtTeacher.com which is the art of Aaron Blaze. Aaron Blaze, uh, if you're not familiar with his work, was a animator with Disney for uh, 26 years. He was the director, co-director on uh, Brother Bear, and he's just a great uh, teacher and artist. He's got tons of stuff uh, on his website, creatureartteacher.com. And this particular brush is part of his custom brushes one. 
that I believe you will receive if you go to his website, wait for a couple minutes, and then you'll get a pop-up that'll show his newsletter. So go ahead and sign up for that newsletter and you'll get a PDF of elephants and I believe his custom brush set one. Now, don't quote me on that. I haven't checked it out recently um, because some people have said, no, you gotta pay for the brushes and stuff like that. So uh, back in the day, whenever I got this brush set, uh, it was completely free and that was really awesome. Now he does sell other brushes, which I recommend and I think I've got all of them. I really like uh, his brushes and the way he does things, very traditional feeling and overall just a, a great um, a great resource for artists and uh, budding illustrators that want to get better at what they do in the craft. So what am I doing? I've got this particular brush, which is the custom brush one set, and I'm pulling Pastel C. Pastel C is a great brush because it's got, I'll go ahead and enlarge it, it's got great texture, it's got good pressure, and what I do is a lot of times I'll go in and I'll adjust some of those brush tip uh, shape dynamics and uh, pressure curves and tilt and stuff like that to customize my feel. But out of the box, it's a pretty decent brush, right? and I've used it on a lot of drawings uh, and it really, I love the traditional look it has and feel. And what I'm doing right now is I'm just going back and I'm refining the sketch. Um, I've talked about this before, I don't trace, I refine and I find where the most sensible line is, especially if he's got a, a costume on or some type of outfit you know, maybe I'll add that as I progress through. I do spend quite a bit of time on the sketch, and it's important to note that the sketch is exactly what it is. It's a sketch, it's not the final artwork. I, as the artist, hold the final say on what this character is gonna be doing, what he's going to look like, and I'm not gonna be held to the sketch specifically. Now, if I was uh, doing this for a client, I would have to get that sketch to a point that they would quote unquote sign off on it and from there I would utilize the sketch in a way to try to preserve the things that I did in the artwork so they know what's coming. Nothing frustrates a client more than you to show than for you to show them something and then you change a bunch of things based upon your inadequacies or the fact that you know, maybe you thought something was going to be a little bit better and it ended up not being better. Um, and that's why we have the sketch. So like right here, I can already see that there's a problem. So I need to go ahead and go. This is one of those things where <coughs> I don't explain too much whenever I'm doing this. Um, but we're going to do that today. So I did this sketch a while back. I did it really quickly. I mean, I'm just thinking about form whenever I do stuff like this. I'm thinking about just here's his here here's his general mass, right? Come here, and he's got like a bean or a potato, and then I give him arms, and then I think about the characterization and what he's going to be doing in that pose. But now that I'm looking, I can see that I've got his horns probably in the wrong place in the initial sketch. So I need to go ahead and correct those and make sure that he's believable. There is something called suspension of disbelief. And you know, if I have his arm coming out, you know, way up here, then as a drawing, you're gonna look at that and go, okay, I, I can see how that works, but it's gonna really stretch that suspension of disbelief. If his arm is really beefy, he won't be able to carry the weight of it. You know, and the same thing applies whenever it comes to anatomy. You want that anatomy to be correct in a sense that he'll be able to live and move in the world that, that you've generated. Um, there's a lot of artwork out there and everybody says there is no bad artwork. And I think that to some degree, if you are looking at it in terms of expression, right? Oh, I've expressed myself, it looks so good, you know? But the arm's completely quote unquote unbelievable. And you're stretching that person, that viewer's um, suspension of unbelief, disbelief. And if you continue to do that with your artwork, then either you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna have haters, and then you're gonna have people that love your work. I'm kind of in the middle since I've I've been doing this a long time. I'm kind of in the middle, and I'm still learning how to do quite a few things, especially as it applies to characters and art. And um, occasionally, I'll do things that kind of don't make sense 
And in that moment, a lot of times I'll have to step back from my artwork and view it and say, yeah, I've stretched it a little bit too far. Maybe I need to rein in some of those quote unquote creative decisions that um, maybe the viewer is just not going to be able to believe, right? Like if you have a gigantic figure uh, that has a lot of mass and weight to him and he's on a very small, um, maybe a gigantic Santa Claus, a, a huge Santa Claus and he's on the tiny reindeer and you're looking at that and you're gonna go, well, that's really funny, but that reindeer would never be able to carry that, <laughs> that Santa Claus. So yeah, suspension of disbelief. That's something I always kind of in my brain bringing you know, home continually to make the characters uh, a little more believable. So, and as I progress through, I'm, I'm posed with certain conundrums, a conundrum and a challenge. So as I did this, I did things very broad and I didn't really focus on quote unquote the uh, accuracy of uh, anatomy, like fingers, like I'll draw an entire mass. Like you see this right here, this is an entire mass, right? So I, I came in, you can even see the sketch work the way I did it is I had like the top of the hand and I came over and I did this and then I had that finger, right? And you're like, well, where's the thumb? So now I'm like, I need to create the thumb and I need to have, here we go. And you've got it coming down like that. So that is a little more believable than what's there. So as I progress through and I'm making that final line, I really need to decide on what makes sense um, and I'm constantly referring back to what I know about anatomy and creatures. So like that finger, a little bit bigger, and I've got this thumb that's going to have to come around here. Let's go ahead and get rid of this. All right. And I've got that other finger that comes here. It's still not big enough. I'm constantly challenged by my own drawing and I, I'm, I'm, you know, feeling things out. Like here's the bend in this finger. There's that. He's got three fingers and then you've got this. It comes down as I erase right here. Okay, so this is a really good example of me quote unquote having a hard time, right? Hands are my Achilles heel. I love doing them, but they're complex, right? Especially if you have, you got three fingers, five fingers, four fingers, and uh, Freddie has uh, three, three fingers and a thumb. So whenever you tilt it, and you have that perspective change, I have to think, here's the top of his hand, here's the side of his hand, here's the top of his fingers, here's the side of his fingers, right? And I have to think in terms of perspective. So I'm trying to figure out the perspective and how that wrist changes right here, okay? And then I've got maybe how it bends over right here. I've got this coming down, candy cane. And is the candy cane facing down to where I can't see the bottom or is it, or I can barely see the bottom because it's kind of tilted away from me. So now that it's tilted away from me, I've got to figure out how, okay, so that comes up. Comes around. And then of course, candy canes are swirled with that candy. And I've got three, four. And this is a stylized character, right? He doesn't have super accurate anatomy, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly in my brain trying to figure out what makes sense. And so I have this right here that's tilted this way, and I've got this arm that comes back. So again, I'm still thinking in terms of shapes and simple shapes and simple reads and silhouettes and I'm trying to make sure that we don't have something that just doesn't look right. You know, a lot of times you'll have somebody that doesn't know anything about artwork and you show it to them and I always know first, if they really like it, they're gonna, boom, oh, I love it. And it's and it's an instant read, right? 
if they not quite sure what's going on or if they quote unquote don't like it and i and i say that with tongue in cheek because a lot of people will like your stuff or they'll like what you're doing but there's just something about it it doesn't work they don't like the style they don't like the composition they don't like the characterization they don't like something and there'll be a pause and then they'll go huh because what's happening is that quick read didn't happen it didn't it didn't hook them in so a lot of times i'll do something let's go ahead and and then I'll wait, I'll wait and I'll come back and I will do a quick read of my own stuff. And a lot of times I'll see something that I didn't before. And that's important to note. You know, whenever you're in front of a piece of artwork for a long time and you're plugging away at it and you're plugging away at it and you're plugging away and then you come back to it and then something comes at you, something jumps. And you're like, oh, now I get it, right? Or I'll, or I'll close my eyes and I'll shake my head and I'll come back and I'll look at it at the corner of my eye and I'll rotate my head and I'll come back and then I'll squint my eyes like this. Whenever you squint your eyes like this and you look at a drawing or a painting, especially whenever you're working in values, you'll see the shadows very clearly in the shape and that really helps, uh, helps me whenever I'm drawing. Everybody's going to be different. Remember that. You know? Like right here, I have his glasses kind of going into... into the frame. And I don't like that. I don't like whenever two lines touch, um, especially the edges. It's okay if they touch and they overlap, but whenever they touch, that's called a tangency. And what that does is it puts your... your um, your uh, lines on the same plane. So if they're like this, if you have, I'm going to give you an example. So if I'm standing back from you and I come here and I have these two fingers touching, when the second they touch, it puts them on the same plane. Even though this one is further back, this one is forward. But the second I do this, then suddenly you know this one is forward and this one is in the back. That tangency has a, a, uh, a way of really just making things unbalanced un in your drawing. <clears throat> so be conscious of those tangencies um, in your artwork. <laughs> We're all subject to those little things that happen in our art that we just don't anticipate. It's like whenever you take a picture, a photograph of somebody, I'm not only framing them with the, uh, you know, with the viewfinder, I'm also looking for elements inside of the picture that I can frame them with. Maybe a, uh, a tree, or maybe some grass, or you know, maybe some different lines that I see in a doorway, or something like that. But the second we maybe have a tree <laughs> coming out of their head, and you're like, how's the tree come out of their head? Well, if they're in front of the tree, and the tree comes up like this, and it's right center and top of their head, then that becomes... Um, a compositional element that is not very good. Okay, so as I talk and I yak on, my apologies. Just trying to do a little bit of a warm up this morning, get the juices flowing. Making sure everything looks copacetic in the context of the artwork and the character design. He is after I'm all my character. I don't I don't want to do something that doesn't make sense for you know for Freddy. Of course, he's my character, so I can do anything I want with him, right? But he has to have certain things on him, like he's got four he's got four toes, he's got three fingers and one thumb. So I can't suddenly have a drawing of him where he's only got three toes because that's not who Freddy is. Freddy's a Yeti and he's got four toes. I'll be doing Freddy here soon in 3D and I will offer the sculpt of him as a possible statue that you guys can order 
if you are interested just let me know in the comments trying to generate some more revenue <laughs> for those of you who know I, I'm I'm a professional illustrator and artist I do uh, collectibles and artwork for theme parks and the retail market and uh, a lot of the stuff that I do is currently in development and uh, I'm not supposed to let you know what I did <laughs> because that's part of the NDA that's part of the mystery that some of the big wig and the companies that I work for you know they don't want to put a face on the artwork there's magic there they think that it just magically appears <laughs> you know um, and whenever I do post something uh, on social media typically it's stuff like this stuff that I've created on my own I, I'm always conscious and very respectful of the companies that I work for because I do not want to hurt their image and I have actually been snagged before for posting stuff on my social media pertaining to their quote unquote um, their characters and stuff so you know I've done stuff for Disney for Warner Brothers for Universal Studios for Pixar for Lucasfilm and whenever you go and you say oh I did this you know then you're gonna be like wait a minute that's a Marvel character you didn't design that Marvel character and no I didn't but if I if I created something that Marvel character is doing or if I created something that uh, you know tells a story with that Marvel character in it if I'm not if I'm doing something for the company then you're gonna look at it and go yeah that's that's not your character that's that's so and so like if you do Mario and you actually make it look like Mario and it's not a tribute piece tribute being you actually make it look like Mario but you have the license to do it um, then you know I think that people are gonna throw up a flag and say no that's not your character I recently saw a buddy of mine that was creating tribute pieces tribute pieces and that's there's a difference between doing a, um, a satire piece or something that you design that's funny and you characterize the character doing something funny then it's considered like a satire or something completely out of uh, out of character for that particular uh, or telling a joke or you know it's something along those lines but if you actually do the character and you 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 take that character design and you uh, you know create art, artwork and you start mass producing it then there's things that happen and, and come into play such as copyright infringement you know I looked at a, a friend of mine recently that did some artwork and I actually had to stop myself from I mean it was good he did a good job and you look at it and you go how did you get the license for that and I'm thinking maybe I should ask him and, and I just, I thought, you know, what benefit is going to benefit me to ask him where he got the license for a character that is very well known in video games? Maybe he got the license for it. I really don't know. But it is a scary fine line when you start creating other people's characters in your, and creating him, because you have the ability to, and then you start mass producing them. Doing a tribute piece, a one-off, that's one thing, right? You can do one. And that's sort of like a tribute piece but the second you start printing and mass producing them that that creates a little bit of a, a sketchy area as far as I'm concerned and I don't want to be <laughs> you know and then it, you think about it so a tribute piece that's another thing that's another copyright in, in, a, in, a, in a gray area copyright so if you do it and you post it on your social media it's viewed thousands of times you're marketing yourself um, which I'm, I'm guilty of that. I've, I've done social media pieces as tribute pieces. Um, and it's fun, but you're doing one original. But I don't know how that works, and I don't know the copyright law <clears throat> in general. And, and basically what I've done in my own career in the past few years is try to stay away, especially on my social media, from doing stuff like that. Now, do I have stuff on there? Yeah, I sure do whenever I do a one-off and I take a picture of it I just I think when you start mass producing it and selling it that's when it becomes a little bit more of a quote-unquote issue I'm not trying to get into too many copyright <laughs> laws but yeah I, I think that try and stick with your own stuff
as much as you can. So I'm just coloring in his eyes. He's like, what? Uh, uh, <laughs> candy? Yeah, so that's what we're doing. So in my last video that I did of the um, of the X-Bean pen tablet that I just reviewed, the, t the Pro uh, TP, the 16 Pro TP, which is 4K, I talked about utilizing different programs to do certain things um, in my workflow. So in this instance, I love the brush that I have here in Photoshop. So I do an initial pull with this particular brush in Photoshop and then I'll turn around and as far as blocking in the color, I use another program called Clip Studio Paint. Now, can I do everything in Photoshop? Yeah, I sure can. But I like that feature over in Clip Studio Paint a lot. Yeah, see, now I'm gonna go ahead. I've gotten rid of that initial under sketch. Let's go ahead and do this. He's got his little bridge right here. Believe it or not, this little bridge will help define his nose because he doesn't. He he has a nose, but it's hidden under his you know under his areas <laughs> right there. So let's go ahead and color this in. Yeah, very cool. Let's go ahead. And a lot of time, I had somebody I had somebody tell me, dude, you can't keep zooming in and out and doing a bunch of weird stuff and moving your drawing and starting to give me C6. And I'm like, I, do I do that? And I thought, yeah, I do. I'm always doing this and this and this and this and zooming out and going here and doing this and that. And it is frustrating for those of you who watch. Now, some of you are used to it by now, but some of you are like, dude, you're making me sick. I'm going to throw up all over the place. And I apologize. It's, it's literally part of my workflow to zoom in and out because I'm constantly like I'll zoom in and out and I'll do this and I'll close my eyes and I'll come back that's looking at the drawing with different eyes you're like how do you do that you moron you, you've only got two set of eyes no it, it's fresh eyes and instead of me getting up taking a five minute walk every ten minutes and coming back and looking I'll close my eyes and clear my brain and clear my palate. it's like cleansing your palate right you cleanse your palate um, in between certain foods so you don't have those foods intermix and that's basically what I'm doing I'm cleansing my uh, my artistic eye palette <laughs> as I completely mess everything up so okay so do a little bit of a foreground and a background reference okay keeping things simple today I'm not going to give him an outfit. He does wear clothes, but he's not naked. He's not naked right now. He's got his fur coat on. All right? So after I get through, here we'll go ahead and do this. So I'll start looking for little detail elements or areas that I haven't closed the line in because I want him to be cohesive. So let's go ahead and come here. And if you notice, like here on the on the side of his foot, so his foot is constructed like this. So we have here. Here's his knee, comes up, right, and it attaches. Here's his hip up here, and then maybe you have bone structure here. Here's his heel, and comes out to all of his feet. I know that's a lot of lines and confusing, but in my mind's eye, I can see it. So then we have fur. You want to kind of curve the fur in the direction that the form is, right? If I have this fur, I don't want to have the fur coming up here. It makes no sense, right? You have that change of direction in the form that you see with your eye. You want that form or that form, the, the fur to curve over. I'm gonna have to get some more coffee. <laughs> that fur to curve over that form. So I'll do this, and you see how it's curved because you know that toe comes here and it curves, right? There's a curve right there. So I'm constantly thinking, and then we have the foot come in here, especially when I put in fur. I want it to make sense. 
and then since these are hard, made of keratin, maybe they're slightly shiny, so you're gonna have a little bit of sheen on here. That helps define the character a little bit better, and then you have that split in his tongue. So maybe it goes like this. And then we'll have that darkened in right there. And then we've got the split come right there. Okay. And a very good example of the whole curve and using fur and using um, certain key uh, visual elements in my drawing, you can see right here, I've curved, I've curved, I've curved, and that helps define that uh, shape, uh, his horns, much better than if, if I were to just keep it blank. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and we will thinking. You know, the more and more that I do this and I'm and I'm developing this character, certain things, you know, does he have square glasses? Does he have round glasses? Does he have glasses at all? Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Um, the glasses make him vulnerable. It, it's 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 a, a design choice that I gave him early on, and then occasionally I'll have it to where he doesn't have glasses and maybe he's doing an activity or maybe I just want to show his his uh, his uh, face a little bit better. Um, and then I'm thinking, okay, what small piece of clothing can I give him that will make him a little bit more attractive? So a lot of times, especially in Photoshop and digital artwork, I can go in and I can experiment. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go ahead and experiment. I'm going to I'm going to push him in terms of his transparency uh, back a little bit. And since it is Christmas time, instead of giving him a Christmas sweater, which I've given him in other areas, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give him a, a scarf. It doesn't make a lot of sense for a Yeti to have a scarf because he's got a fur coat, but the, the, the characterization, the character of him, that one little piece of clothing will give an indication maybe it's cold outside, right? So again, just thinking simple shapes right now, just making it really simple. Okay, see so right now what's happening, okay, so I can do a couple things. So you see this area right here, you see how far up that arm goes? So now I've got to do something a little bit different. I can't have that line cut through because it's coming over, it's coming over his arm. So I need to come here, and I need to have that come over his arm. Okay. So, and since I'm on a different layer, I just added a layer really quick. I can do that without upsetting the balance of the drawing. Okay, so right here, this is what I was talking about. When you have, let's go and zoom in a little bit. Whenever you have this line coming up with the scarf and it intersects with the edge of his finger, it puts them on the same plane, so I can't have that. So literally that jumped out to me, and now we're going to push it. We're gonna have that come down and around. Okay. All right, so we're gonna have that come up. So now I'm thinking, okay, so the scarf is made of fabric. Recruiters calling me. I'm constantly getting called because I have a resume on Monster and I'll get called for uh, recruitment for different projects and freelance projects. And I've gotten, I've gotten quite a few uh, projects like that. But a lot of times, um, you know, they'll get me right in the crux of the project <laughs> whenever I'm working on something. So my apologies for that uh, distraction. So now, so the scarf, I have to think, okay, it's got to come in. How am I going to do this? So, okay, so it's double layered and it comes around. 
Okay. And it's going to come up. Okay, now here's a really good example of me struggling. So I'm struggling right now. I'm struggling because first, I, I'm, I'm pretty solid with the pose. I like the way the pose is. He's leaning slightly forward. So you're going to have that scarf right there on the left-hand side. It's going to come up and it's going to come over, right? I need, to, I need to make sure the width is the same. So maybe I'll measure really quick and we'll come up here. Okay, so that's going to come over this particular form because this scarf comes up and it comes over. So there needs to be thickness to the scarf coming over and then there's gravity. So it comes over and then gravity is going to pull it back in and it's going to contour to the uh, cur curvature of his belly. So I can't have it come straight down like this. It needs to come out. It needs to come down. And then it, it kind of it sways, right? It sways. It's got weight to it. I have to think, okay, it's swaying a little bit. Let's go ahead and have it come down here. And maybe it's a little bit wider at the bottom. And then, okay, so I'm okay with that. And then I've got to have this side come up a little bit. Because again, we've got the thickness, and that's not even working. The thickness of the scarf is not consistent all the way through. And I need to make sure that it at least is an easy to read form. So then we come to the edge, and as we all know, excuse me, the scarf has little frilladoos at the bottom. So let's go ahead and we'll go to one, two, three, four. Now in this stage, I, I'm not concerned so much with the details of the frilladoos. I just need to get them in there because this is not this is not the final, you know, final drawing. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to have these come down. And what is the shape of the frilla do? Is it a circle? Is it a tassel? Is it a square? Is it what is it? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just little tassels that will come down. And I don't want to have them too even. So maybe this one is kind of bunched up. He's caught on the other one. And then this one is free form. I only did four. Make it sort of like a Harry Potter scarf every time I think. I've been drawing so many Harry Potter scarves in my career. I've drawn so many of them on different characters. and Because I do a lot of stuff for uh, Harry Potter, the Harry Potter franchise. And uh, being familiar with the different house scarves and how they're constructed. and <laughs> It's, uh, yeah. Okay, so now... Since he's a Yeti, he's outside, I'm starting to imbue some of those character traits that are specific to Yeti. So outside, therefore, the scarf, even though it's a human element, we've humanized him, and he has glasses. So let's go ahead and give the scarf a little bit of character. How do you do that? Maybe there's little things here and there. And again, we're still at that scarf, rough scarf stage. Maybe he's just got a little, he's repaired it here and there. So it's kind of, it's not brand new. It's seen a couple seasons, right? Okay. So now, uh, since that's on a separate layer, let's go ahead and I'm going to push back on the transparency. We're going to beef up the transparency on him. And we're going to go ahead and create another layer, which will be the final sketch layer. And even though it's going to be final sketch, sorry about my hair. I need a haircut. The final sketch layer, I still want to give it some character. I want to keep it loose, right? I, this character isn't real tight. It's not vectorized. He's, he's, I love the sketchiness of him. So I'm going to, I'm going to make this scarf. What I can actually do, just to make things a little bit cleaner. So let's go back to the original sketch. I'm going to copy him. And then I'm going to take my eraser and I'm going to get rid of the lines underneath the scarf to kind of solidify where I want it to be. And then you can see things a little bit clearer because, you know, I'm looking at this going, Ugh. so here, again, you know, I talked about that tangency right there. I got rid of that. Got rid of all that. And I zoom out. So 
sorry about that. I mean, make you sick. You're like, <laughs> man, you're going to make me vomit. I'm going to throw all over you. I'm going to throw up. It's going to be great. Okay, so let's put that scarf underneath. There is that. Now, if at any point in time I'm like, I've totally messed up, I can go on the history palette. I've got 30 history undos. Or I can just go back to the sketch without the scarf. So Photoshop um, really allows me to have a lot of creative freedom with, I think that's a layer I don't need. That's a layer I do not need because I want him on one sketch layer. Okay. Yeah, Photoshop allows me to do a lot of things that otherwise, if I was in a traditional medium, would not be allowed to do or it'd be difficult to resolve some of those issues. Okay. You can see I'm just kind of keeping things a little rough because, you know, if you've ever been on my channel before, you know I like things rough. <laughs> Sorry. It is a Thursday. Back in the day, whenever I worked in the studio, I had a couple norm things that I did, and people, you know, after I left were like, we miss you. I'm like, you should have paid me more money, you moron. I'm just kidding. Um, the things that I would do, like I would play, I loved 80s music during Halloween. I always played classic 1960s and 50s Halloween tunes and kept it really fun because we were, you know, we had different opportunities to play music in the general forum um, and then in the general populace is what I mean. Oh, I need to erase that. Um, and then I would, uh, you know, on Thursday I would talk about, you know, this is Thursday, this is basically Friday Eve and, you know, this is called the weekend slide because, you know, in terms of the week goes, you have... Monday, which, you know, Monday, let's be honest, Monday you're coming in, you're like, you don't know who, even know who you are. You're barely getting in there, and, and you don't really do any work until around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock after lunch, because that's when the coffee finally kicks in. And by the time you get into a workflow, it's 4.45, and then it's 5 o'clock or 5.30 by the time you leave. And then, Tuesday comes in, you're there, man. You're there on time, you get there. Some people are early. I was always an early guy. You get there, and you're like, I'm ready to work, and you work the entire day. That's when you get the most work done, is on Tuesday. Tuesday is the work day. Wednesday, oh, Wednesday, it's hump day, right? you got to get over the hump, so it's drudgery getting in there. By noon, you're like, oh, and then you get some work from maybe 1.30 till 3 o'clock, and then you're like, okay, Wednesday, I got over the hump, I feel good. And then you, you leave, and then come, let's go ahead and do this. This, and then come Thursday. It's it's Friday Eve. You you get in there. You, you're some people are early. Thursday is good because you're excited about the weekend. You're already talking about the weekend. You're thinking about it. Friday Eve. Oh yeah, it's so good. You get through. And, you know, you come back. You get some work done. You get some emails out because you're already looking. And some people, you know, maybe I'm going to take a three day weekend. And today is my Friday. And blah blah blah. And you know, if you ever get sick, then Thursday's the day to do it because you definitely can take advantage of the uh, the extra day of Thursday and then get better. You know, nobody wants to get sick, but I'm just giving you the real world view of what I used to experience in the in the studio world. And then Friday, Friday you get in there, you just stroll in there, you're in a good mood, you're feeling good, you got your coffee or tea or whatever you drink, maybe it's an energy drink, and you sit down, and you're like, I'm gonna get today's gonna be awesome. And then by 10:30, you're already thinking, ah. Oh, Today's Friday. Oh, gosh. And then maybe you take a group lunch on Friday. Yeah. And you're already thinking it's it's the weekend. You know, after you've come back from lunch, let's be honest, on Friday, maybe it's 1 o'clock, you're already the weekend. The weekend has happened, right? And I used to play Friday. It's Friday. I'm in love. Yeah. I used to play that on Friday at about 4 o'clock, and then that's it. You're, you're browsing the Internet. If you're allowed to do that work, and then, you know, Friday, maybe you go out at 4.45. If you get off at 5, you look at you look at the sun and, you know, take a long bathroom break. And then, boom, Friday hits. It's the weekend. You're done. <laughs> you know? So that's... And then, of course, Saturday, it's the recoup day. We love Saturday. Um, and then Sunday, depending on uh, what you do, can be a sleep-in day. And then, uh, you know, if you... 
If you're a partier like I am, I'm a super hard partier. I love to party. I'm just kidding. I don't party. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. I, I go to sleep. That's my party. I go to sleep. Um, so that's, you know, I used to really have fun um, in my studio days encourage and teach and help and get stuff done and then of course you have the days that unmanageable deadlines that you you just can't imagine how am i going to get this done i've got you know 15 turnarounds to do in three days there's no way and they're like you have to get it done so yeah okay so this is where i am this is the final sketch boom so what i'm going to do is i'm probably going to Actually, let's go over to Clip Studio Paint real quick because even though this is a longer drawing, I, I'm trying to explain to you the process and how I think and how, you know, I make things, I, how I make the magic happen, right? Go to Photoshop. So let's go ahead. Where am I at? I'm doing Clip Studio Paint. Where is that at? Clip Studio. Oh, there it is. Okay, Clip Studio Paint. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is one of those... He's like a ninja program, right? It's one of those programs that a lot of people, I think, have known about for a while because it used to be called Manga Studio. And I love Clip Studio Paint. It is a fantastic program. And let's go here. Uh, let's go to the desktop. Who keeps calling me? Same person. So... For those of you, yeah, you see that? Stop calling me. Golly, and you left a message. If I wanted to talk to you, I would have picked up. Okay, so let's go ahead down to the Yeti sketches. Freddy Coffee, you can see him. <laughs> I like that one. And we have Freddy, here's the Yeti sketches right here. Okay. So yeah, Clip Studio Paint. Why do I like this program? First, it's great. It's cheap. It's robust. You can open Photoshop documents. You can save as layers. It's got layer effects. There's a ton of tutorials to use it. It's got really cool brush rendering engine. It's fast. Um, but one of the things that I use it for is quick block in. Quick color block in. So I, I go to the lasso fill. Here's the lasso tool. Here's all the subtools. It's got tons of different tools. It's got a really cool perspective tool in here that I've used quite a few times. But I like the lasso fill. So here's the color that I want to use, which is white, which is no color. And then whenever I draw in, it blocks in the color that I want. So really cool as well is the paint bucket. So right now I've got it to refer to other layers. Here's the other layer that it refers to right here. And it's conscious of all the other layers, so I can go in and fill really quickly. You see how fast that is. And it's just great that I can do that. Especially if you have... It, this really works well when you have vector lines and you have everything really tight. Um, oh, I forgot to do that. I'm showing my boote. As I'm showing you the drawing process, I forgot to do something. So let's go ahead and go here. Here's that rough pencil. I love it rough. Okay, so here we go. Let's go ahead and do that fur right there. And I'll zoom out, looks good. Go back to the paint bucket and sample and fill. Now you can see in some of the areas that I've got some weird square anomalies like this. That's because if you look, I didn't quite get that in, so I just switch over to the eraser. And I do something called housekeeping. So let's do this. Back to the brush, and I come here, and I've got that lasso fill again. So it's not. I mean, the the paint bucket tool is really good for certain things. It's not. It's like uh, it's like having hammer and nail. It's very broad, right? And especially if I want some color underneath those lines. So, and you can, and this is a really quick way to get value in, and I'm going to show you something here in just a second to help you guys, again, with your process, speed things up, make it go as lickety split as you can. Here we go. Okay, so that's good. He looks good. So stuff like this. So whenever I move this, you can see I don't have, um, 
color underneath those lines and ultimately it doesn't really make any difference for me I'm just going really fast quick and dirty you know if I really want to make it amazing then I'll make it amazing okay so let's go ahead here's all the rest of the yetis oh, he looks like he's having such a good time okay so let's go ahead we'll sample this color okay let's get rid of that and let's block in his face See, I can just get really broad because I'm doing things in layers here. Keeping it, keeping things real, it's going to be good. Okay, so let's go ahead and again, I'm not using that paint bucket because this is a little more defined artwork that I need to get in there and do. Okay, so you see I've missed a couple areas. I'm not too worried about that right now because I can go back and I can just you know, put color in there where I need it. Let's go ahead and sample again. Go back to the blue layer. Okay. All right. And I'm going to show you the strength of this tool in two seconds here. And let's go back. Okay. You can see how very quickly you can get things done. And if I had all these lines really perfect, going in and filling things in would be really easy. So let's go ahead and make sure I get his nails. And his little patties. We'll do that. Okay. And then we come here. Okay. All righty. color in his simple and since I got all these in a separate layer I'm going to show you something really quick like y'all that I can do now there's a myriad of ways that people do what I'm fixing to show you um, I'm going to show you the quick and dirty way and this isn't necessarily the best way to do things but it is a fast way to do it so if you want to put in some real simple shadows and you don't want to have to be able to quote unquote manipulate them you can do them on the same layer so all you got to do is come up here to the little uh, icon with a lock it says lock transparency so I've locked the transparency so the only area that I'm allowed now to draw in is going to be the area that you see on that layer so this is a blue layer so blue is the only area so let's choose a different color I'm gonna go ahead and use the lasso and you see just like in Photoshop I can go in and just block in color really easily. Um, so let's go ahead and sample this, sample this blue. We're gonna go ahead and give a little bit darker hue. And what you can do is come in and literally see how that just gives a nice, easy shadow. I'll do this a lot of times whenever basically all I'm doing is like a color study if I need to do a really fast color study like super fast and I'm not too concerned about um, you know super dark shadows or I can use really dark shadows or I can use you know and I'm not going in with reflected light or anything like that so you can see I can go in and just you can get a lot of really cool fun things happening right even if I want to go a little bit darker um, and the same applies so I'm still you know if I come back to the paint bucket and I go here and I do that it's still gonna refer to the other layer even though it's locked in transparency so I can still let's go to the pink 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 no pink uh, I've got a pink there we go so again I can go in and block stuff in really quickly whoops that's the wrong thing wrong no right lasso fill and since I've locked the transparency on the blue layer even though it's a blue layer I can still do whatever I want it's my drawing so I can you know like you can see going in and, and just putting in some darker values I'm gonna sample that blue again and we're gonna go ahead a little bit darker and I can go in and just get some really simple shadows it's very quick this is super quick you know I don't necessarily recommend this if you're you're gonna go in and do some really highly detailed rendering but like I said it is quick
So you can do the same thing on white. If I want to go in and, and adjust the white and I want to put some real simple shadows, I'm going to go and lock the transparency. And you can do the same thing. Let's say, um, selection from layer, create selection, layer settings. See, you can say clip to layer below. So if I want to go here, I go ahead and attach and I say here is layer setting, clip to layer below. So now I've created a clipping mask. So let's go ahead and sample that. Whoops. Wrong. Go back. Here we go. And we're going to make this a little bit darker. And I'm going to go up here to the purple hue and I'm going to make it a little bit purple. So now I've done the same thing as locking that transparency, but I have this on its own layer. So I go, I can change the layer transparency of it, which is pretty cool. I can go down to multiply, which is what I'll typically use for my shadowing. And I can go in and you can see very quickly, I can make some really fun shadow shapes. And it's important to note and always important to understand how shadow shapes work, right? You've got that form here. The light is upper right hand side. Okay. Comes down. You see how quick and dirty things can get. <laughs> because again, I like things dirty. I like them very dirty. Okay, here we go. And I don't have to worry about any of it going and overlapping any other color because I've got that layer transparency locked. So let's go ahead and do this. And very lickety split. You can see how quickly you can get things done. This. I have a buddy of mine, this is what he uses for all of his shadowing techniques. And I'm like, well, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I like it. You like it? That's very good. Let's go ahead and do this. Hey, shadows. Shadows come around. Here we go. Okay. Very quick can get stuff done, right? I'm gonna sit there noodling. And then I can always come back and I can adjust the transparency, which is fun. Oh, no, yeah, I can adjust the transparency on it. Okay. Okay, so that's pretty good. Let's go ahead and create another layer. Save, very important you save. And now I will do, <clears throat> just for giggles, let's go really fast. Let's make this all red. You see, it's, when you start blocking in the colors, you know, we're on top of other colors. So if I were to mess up and go, holy smack, you can just control Z and do that. Okay. Good, and then we come back. We're gonna go and lock the transparency on this. So we're gonna sample the color white. And what am I gonna do? You guessed it. Let's go ahead and make him into a peppermint sticks. One, two, white, red, white. Nope, little mental note. You know, even though that should have been white, I don't want two whites next to each other. I want more contrast. So I'm gonna go ahead and just modify the pattern. And then we come up here, and then we come and we right click, and we come to the select, oh, I'm sorry, layer settings, and we're going to clip to layer below. Again, creating that clipping mask. So we're going to sample that, which is a purple color. Let's go ahead and go purple, a little bit darker. Okay, and I'll go ahead and create my shadow. Okay, and I'm going to adjust the transparency of it, and we're going to go to multiply. Boop. I'm going to make sure the shadow isn't 
too much darker than the one on his body. Right. And you can see how he's coming together. He's coming together. So, um, what I'm going to do since this video is so long, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and put you guys on time lapse and you can watch the process. And in the end, I'll show you the final and do just kind of a talk and wrap up. Um, here's the deal. I, I'm experimenting right now because I'm going to be doing some uh, tutorials. And I'm going to be putting them up on Gumroad, and you'll have the link directly from the channel. Am I going to be charging like $25? No, I'll be charging 3 to $5 maximum for each tutorial, and it'll show you step-by-step um, -step process of how to create images and characters and artwork in the digital um, and traditional realms. So hopefully you guys will um, help support the channel in that capacity. But uh, let's go ahead and get on the time lapse. And uh, yeah. After 600 plus videos, a little light off went on my head. I'm like, you know, I should probably create something that people have a little bit more interaction with and a little bit more resource. So, uh, anyway, let's go ahead and finish Freddy. Use some very cool watercolor brushes um, that I love doing. I love watercolor. I love painting digitally. I love doing stuff like this because it gives you guys an insight as to how I accomplish the tasks in front of me. Could I spend a ton more time on it? Yeah, I would probably imbue a little bit more texture into them because I like that hand done feel. Um, you know, that emulates a lot of my traditional work, some of the work that maybe you can see something like right here um but overall you know i just wanted to keep things really simple um yeah so going to be offering some of those tutorials some of those things on my website uh uh you know my youtube channel that you can click i've already got some merch down there that you know nobody seems to want to buy which is fine <laughs> i'll be putting some holiday stuff up there as the holidays progress and maybe you'll see some of freddie and Eddie up there as well. So today was more or less a process video showing you exactly what I do. And this is, you know, part and partial to the channel teaching you, showing you different facets of a professional illustrator's life. You know, today, what time is it? It's about 1045. So next thing that I'll do in my day, and I even, you know, I might show you the day in the life, the day in the life of an illustrator. Everything's going to be different, <laughs> especially you know, depending on what the illustrator does, maybe they their process is super labor intensive, and maybe they got a ton of stuff to do. Maybe it's digital, maybe it's traditional. Who knows? And maybe it might change up uh, as they progress through the day here and there. 
You know, my day, typically what I'll do is I'll slide in here at about 8 o'clock, 8.30, you know, after, because typically I get up at 5.30, and, you know, I get some personal time to myself, and, and, you know, then I cook breakfast, and then I move on to my work, and then about 11 o'clock I do a workout from 11 to 12, and then after that I take a nap, of course I have lunch, and then I take a nap, and then I come back hard and heavy until 4.30 or 5 o'clock, and then if I need to work in the evening, I'll work in the evening. You know, early on in, in my freelance endeavors, uh, after being in the studio for a very long time, well over 15 years, 20, you know, 15 years, I promised myself that I would uh, do things a little bit different. Um, you know, having those super hard deadlines is not very conducive to my creative mind. I like to having a little bit of stretch and pull. Um, and now that I've uh, kind of created my own schedule, uh, I basically work until I don't want to work anymore. And uh, that's not a luxury that comes very easily. It's, it's a discipline, but also that's something that you work for. Do I have deadlines? Yes. Do I work in the evening? Yes. Do I have all-nighters? Yes. That happens, especially in the freelance world. But as I encourage all of you who are in your artistic journey, artwork is supposed to be fun, right? These little drawings that I do, they're fun. And the channel was developed as a fun element in my career. I have enough deadlines. I have enough projects. I have enough things that really take my <laughs> stress level to level 10. But at the end of the day, drawing is supposed to be fun. So I encourage you to find that passion, find that one thing that you can do in the artistic world, especially if you're trying to be an artist or if you're one that already exists. Find that one thing that you can really enjoy, whether it's drawing, sculpting, singing, painting, writing in a journal, whatever it is, and that's yours. That is your time. So I encourage you to do that because it'll make you a better artist. It'll calm you down and it'll give you a perspective that a lot of people are looking for, especially in today's day and age when jobs are really hard and, and uh, you know, they're asking you to do a ton more stuff and also artistic jobs are a lot harder. So I encourage you to chase, find, and draw those horizons as every single day the sun comes up and it sets. Just enjoy the small things in life, okay? And we'll see you next time.